Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Tinfoil Helmet. Atlantis is a really hard subject. I've actually made fun of videos talking about Atlantis before. Thoth and friends constructed an entire network of temples and structures along this grid fourth dimensionally, and then it needs about 13,000 years of continuous energy flow for it to actually turn on. But I promise you, Atlantis was real. I'm gonna give you a quick recap, but honestly, you should go back and watch the whole series, if not just the first video. There's a lot I've already set up that I'm not going to go over again. So we've made it this far in the series. We can start to put all this information together, but what does it really mean? I know some of you have come here already knowing what I'm gonna say. I feel like everyone should know this by now. And if you don't know this by now, you got some catching up to do. This is it, everyone. This is the big show. I'm proving Atlantis. But before we get started, I have to thank today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon, of course, was co-founded by Ray J, but it already has the backing of a ton of other celebrities in the business, such as my main man, Snoop Dogg. I was actually out for dinner with Snoop the other night, and I was like, Snoop, I need to be serenaded by a queen. And Snoop was like, hey, baby, you want to tickle those ears? Check out these new earbuds. They'll do the trick. So we listened to Adele's latest breakup song, and I cried for like an hour. I've been using these every everyday E25s for a while now, and I'm very happy with them. Everything is magnetic, so the earbuds just pop right into place and automatically charge, and the case is hinged, so it's easy to handle. And the case also has its own battery, which allows you to recharge the earbuds up to four times in a single charge. And then just plug the case into a USB to charge the whole unit. And the latest model is their best yet, with more bass, six hours of continuous playtime, and a more compact design that comes with a variety variety of size options to give you that perfect noise isolating fit. I'm always listening to music whether I'm working out or taking a hike through the woods. A good beat gives me energy and keeps me focused. And the everyday E25s come in a bunch of fun new colors. Of course I got these black ones. But they're so snug and tight that I keep forgetting that I'm even wearing them. And they're super easy to use. After you've paired them to your device, all you gotta do is take them out of the case, stick them in your ear and you're listening to your favorite music. And the best part is that you get like the same high quality sound as premium headphones, but for like half the price. And I'm here to make them even cheaper for you today. All you gotta do is click that link in the description below. Go to buyraycon.com skeptic to get 15% off of your purchase. So far in the series, we've established that there's plenty of archaeological evidence from ancient sites to prove that our history books are a complete lie. And there used to be a global civilization over 12,000 years ago, during the last ice age. Then in the second video, I demonstrated that the old world had harnessed the power of electricity and understood it much like Nikola Tesla did, integrating their technology into their architecture and turning buildings and structures into electricity generating machines based on the same design as the ancient pyramids of the Giza Plateau. And in my last video, we explored how early Homo sapiens used to be ruled by another species of humans called Homo Denisovan. They were at least three times our size, and they were much more technologically advanced than sapiens 30,000 years ago. If we go by their statues at Gobekli Tepe, the oldest ones were very tall. Then over time, they slowly shrank. But do you think that the first ones were actually this tall? And in that video, I called them many things. The giants, the cone heads, the sons of God, the angels, the Nephilim. These were the gods or the ancient aliens of the old world. These albino giants were the rulers of Atlantis. I started this series off by promising you that I was going to solve the riddle of the Sphinx, and I am building up to that. The Sphinx is the key to understanding that there used to be a civilization during the Ice Age, because the erosion on the Sphinx is at least 12,000 years old. But the single greatest enigma from ancient Egypt are these vases. These are found in the oldest burial sites from dynastic Egypt, but they're made from solid granite, and they're older than the pyramids. Egyptians from that era should have no idea how to work with granite like this. Not only should they not be able to shape and form the outside of this vase, but they've hollowed it out 
like a normal jug. There is no fathomable way they could have done that. And again, I remind you, these are the oldest artifacts. Most of them were found in burial sites, so obviously these were heirlooms from Atlantis. I want to be clear here, when I say Atlantis, I don't mean the specific city described by Plato that was ruled by Poseidon. I mean the global civilization that existed during that time. There are a lot of really good possible sites for where the city could be, but I don't want to make this video about that. Now, if you remember Peru, these strange stone walls, did you know that this style of architecture can be seen all around the world? The trademark of Atlantis is most obvious in South America. Preserved high up in the mountains, we see amorphous stone blocks that are perfectly curved, bent, and twisted around each other to make a nearly perfect seal on all four sides. The bottom of each stone is convex, and the top is concave. They cup into each other so that no matter how much the stones shake, they always settle perfectly back into place. The walls are basically earthquake proof. The most common term for this style of architecture today is polygonal. We see this exact style of architecture in India and Cambodia. There are several temples built in this style. In Greece, there are a few examples, not just walls, but even a pyramid. There are several examples in Italy as well. Of course, there's some in Turkey, but really, Turkey's got a little of everything. Not a ton of people know about the walls in Japan. Most of these walls today are the bases of temples and palaces, and there's a lot of simple design features that tie these sites together. Another interesting trademark, a lot of these stones actually have these funny nubs, and there's a lot of debate about what the purpose of these nubs are. Um, there is no purpose, you're not supposed to see them. Regardless, you can see these nubs in several of these megalithic sites. Did you know that the base of the Menkore Pyramid was built in this style? And looky-loo! It's got nubs too. They all use the exact same angled doorway design. They also use the exact same angled window. And in my Conehead video, you remember that I showed you how the giants migrated through the Polynesian Islands across the ocean to Easter Island? Well, would you be disappointed if Easter Island 2 did not have their own Atlantean walls? So now we have to answer the questions. How did they do it? And how do I know that they were giants? One new word we're gonna learn today is geopolymer. Now this is a technology that we've only just recently started to develop. Similar to concrete, geopolymers are stronger and more permanent bonds, creating a concrete that's much more like a real rock. The stuff we make today requires a lot of different chemicals and mixing, but I'm not saying that they did it back then the way we do it today. I'm just saying they had their own geopolymer technology. No man in the universe has spent more time studying these stones than Brian Forrester. Unfortunately, he and I disagree on how these stones were carved. He believes that it was with tools that are more advanced than the ones that we have today. And though I believe that he's uncovered legitimate examples of ancient machining, the vast majority of these stones were softened and formed like bricks before they were re-hardened. Of all the stones that he has showcased over the years, none I find more interesting than the damaged and eroded ones. Natural granite is an igneous rock. As it forms, it mixes with itself and even picks up imperfections. Unlike limestone that forms in sheets, when it erodes, it absolutely can break off in sheets. But granite can't do that. This stone should not have been able to peel like an onion. If this granite has layers, that means that the outside of the stone hardened at a much faster rate than the inside of the stone. That is entirely unlike natural granite. Now it's story time. Legend has that when King Solomon was building the temple in Israel, he didn't want to use any iron implements because they were considered weapons of war. And he wanted to build a temple of peace. But how do you carve giant stone blocks without iron tools? The story goes on to say some sort of mystical bird dropped something on a rock and was able to turn that rock into a nest. That sounds like a dumb story. Sure, but there are many legends around the world describing birds using sticks or leaves to turn rocks 
into nests. Here's a little story that popped up on the Graham Hancock website on the Brian Forster subforum. He was going up a valley, the Parahiva Valley in southern Peru on the Amazonian side. He came to a granite cliff in a gorge. This cliff was absolutely upright like a wall. And then there were these perfect little round holes all over it. As he came down the trail, he saw little birds that went in and out of these holes. So he said to the people, what's that? And they said, well, they nest in those holes. The villagers described that these birds drilled these holes themselves using little twigs. What? The answer to this riddle is so simple. This is a simple chart. It describes how when a tree is drilling its roots into the soil and it encounters rock like granite or basalt, that it will find and exploit cracks in those rocks. But it's not always that simple. Sometimes the tree runs into roadblocks. It can't find a crack or the crack is too small and it can't make it bigger. The tree is able to excrete a chemical compound that dissolves the rock Trees can literally melt or powderize rocks or heavy metals. That process is called chelation. I hope it also makes sense now why trees absolutely love growing on these ancient temples. And now some of these old mysteries like how did this wall melt? How did these stairs melt? Well, now they're not really that fantastical a mystery are they? And now the quarries make sense. All of the supposed quarries in Peru look more like piles of clay that the builders were scooping from, as opposed to natural formations that they were carving from. A lot of areas where the stone is strange and amorphous, and some of them almost look like slag piles where they were throwing all of the imperfections. Oxalic acid. It's called oxalic acid. That's the chemical bond right there. You're welcome. The giants didn't have better technology than us. They were just more clever than we were. I'm going to let Dr. Charles Koss describe some of this for you. There's a link to his video in the description. So I'm not gonna pretend that I know the exact chemical compound or the exact process that they used to create stones like this, but I don't think that I need to. What's really impressive is not just that they were able to do this with the stone. I think it's important to understand to what extent they were actually employing this. Let's go back to one of my favorite sites, Machu Picchu. Look around at the other mountaintops. They're nothing like this mountaintop. A mountaintop just completely shaved clean. The ancient Peruvians literally cut the top of the mountain off. That would have been a monumental undertaking. This is another site in Peru, Sacsayhuaman. So large that even knowing what we know about how they were able to form these, they're way too big for normal sized people to have been able to set them. One of my favorite examples, Lion Rock in Sri Lanka. An ancient palace or mansion was built on top of this plateau. We see the same thing with this example. Example, the entire top has been sheared flat and also features different levels. But the logic of Atlantis is 12,000 years ago, the sea level was 300 feet lower. Just like today, most major cities would have been coastal. And because the sea level rose about 300 feet since the last ice age, most of those cities would be deep under the ocean. And though we can find several examples of Atlantean architecture underneath the ocean in the Mediterranean Sea, we can't find any that are exactly 300 feet that would be too convenient. We can find some very interesting examples. My favorite example is off of the island of Yanaguni, Japan. This structure is only sunken about 85 feet below the ocean, but when divers discovered this in the late 80s, early 90s, it was first dismissed as a fluke natural formation. However, after years of divers visiting the site, it became more and more obvious that this was in fact a man-made site. There are several footpaths around the base. There are stairways along the side, stairways large enough for giants, there are two turtle statues, and people have mapped out a logical layout. So now that you know, do you think that this is the ultimate form of this technology? Or do you think maybe they had learned to 
put these stones into molds and create intricate statues. They couldn't possibly have been carved. Do you think maybe they could have made entire temples out of one solid piece of stone? So strong that when an invading army was told to destroy this Indian temple, after hours of blasting it with muskets, cannons, and explosives, they could only manage superficial damage to its finest details. So now that you look at things like these vases or the granite sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid, they make sense now. Another phenomenon you see exact duplicates of granite stones. Obviously, these were made in molds. So I guess the only thing I have left to prove is that it was giants. Yes, some of these stones are too big for normal humans to have set. That doesn't really prove much. If only the giants had left some sort of a mark, some sort of a print on their work, something that would give us a hint as to who made these things and how they did it, a legacy or a signature, if you will. If only these giant people had softened that rock and pressed a body part into it. We just chose to ignore that. So now we go back to these images from Gobekli Tepe. Do you think the giants were actually this tall? Because I think maybe they were. Now, if you need proof that this is not just some random crap that I've made up so that I can make some sort of sense of my theory here, I brought a secret weapon with me. These are images from a Freemason Bible. Now, I don't know if every Freemason Bible is like this. All I know is that this is from a Freemason Bible. What I see is workers collecting chunks of clay or earth from the ground and fashioning it into pillars. And in the back, workers are also collecting clay and forming it into these molds. Clearly, the Temple of Solomon was built using geopolymer. Do you get it? 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 History is a lie.